It's October 13th, 1944, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was on this day that a 22-year-old U.S. Air Force officer called Martin Monti stole an unattended aircraft at an airbase in Naples to begin a journey that would see him become the only known Allied military defector to Nazi Germany. In October 1944. Like, what timing? (laughs) I mean, if you're going to pick a side. I just love an underdog. (laughs) I've got a good feeling about this Adolf guy. Now... (laughs) And his background might explain maybe why he took this view even so late in the war, uh, which was that he was raised in this staunchly anti-communist household and became a sort of firebrand critic of the Western Allies' support for the Soviet Union. And despite having uh, enlisted in the Army Air Corps in 1942, he actually still saw Nazi Germany as being the best hope for stopping what he thought as the real threat to world peace, which was the spread of Bolshevism. So he kind of had this idea, if I'm going to do something and I'm going to take a stand, I guess it's now or never, even though this doesn't look good for the team that I'm joining. He was also anti-Semitic, wasn't he? He had a, mm-hmm. a, a, an interest in the theory of Jewish Wall Street. And also, crucially, he was half German. His mum was German, mm-hmm. wasn't she? So he's got an Italian name, but his mum was German. And there was this whole thing after the First World War where German immigrants who'd come to America were really not made to feel very welcome there. There was a lot of anti-German feeling around. And a lot of their social activities were clamped down on. Some of the German-speaking publications were ceased. And so a lot of Germans, we reckon, although there are no numbers on this, who were American-born, had returned, quote-unquote, to Germany to fight for the Germans. He wouldn't have been the only one. He was just perhaps the most audacious one to do so, whilst under the cover of being a US airman. So he came from this very staunchly Catholic, very anti-communist family in Missouri. He had four brothers and two sisters. All four of his brothers served honourably without defecting to Nazi Germany. Um, <laughs> so this wasn't. I mean, to I be fair, that's we, the absolute minimum, I would say, for serving at all. We, well, he we, was pretty good apart from the bit where he defected to yeah, Nazi yeah, Germany. Yeah. <laughs> so we can't blame it entirely on his upbringing, but there was definitely a strong sentiment, especially among, as you were saying, Oli, Um, German immigrants and their descendants there was this in the 1930s there was a kind of anti-intervention vibe of we shouldn't interfere with what's going on in Europe let's just Mm -hmm. stay out of it and the Mm -hmm. Monty family is kind of part of this and obviously after Pearl Harbor that very quickly lost its sheen. The funny thing was though that once he got into the Air Force he found himself stationed in what's now Pakistan and that was really not close enough to the action for him by half and so he went AWOL and uh, got on a transport plane bound for North Africa and from there he gradually made his way to this US Air Base in Naples, Italy, which was where he got his hands on this P-38 Lockheed Lightning aeroplane and jumped in. It was being repaired. He claimed it was for a test flight, didn't he? Yeah. He's like, oh, I'm just going to test it. Just going to take it out for a quick spin, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the absolutely shocking thing about this whole story is that he was able to talk himself onto three separate military planes. He went yeah. to mm. Cairo, Tripoli, and finally Naples. And no one seems to have questioned him at the time. And then, this is, but this is a weird thing. This is a thing that runs throughout the Monty story, is that he just go through so many weird flip-flops it's so hard to work out what his intentions were at any one Mm. time because when he got to Naples the first thing he did was visit a base where some of his friends from his Air Force training were stationed and he apparently asked to be assigned to their combat squadron but of course he just turned up out of nowhere he didn't have any paperwork or documentation so they obviously couldn't let him do that so it does seem like maybe Maybe he was always going to do that. Maybe he was planning on stealing one of their planes and flying to into the German mm. occupation. But there's just all these weird moments in the story where you're like, wait, was he about to change his mind? You know, did he think, if I can't get into combat, I'm just going to defect to Nazi Germany? Which kind of seems like an extreme step to take. So he did manage quite quickly to convince the Germans that his intentions were to join them. And they used him immediately as a propaganda tool. There was a uh, an English language uh, radio station in Bremen which was being made to sound as if it was coming from the United States to Americans to try and radicalise Americans. And he broadcast in English on that station, which I would absolutely be fascinated to hear, but I've been scouring Mm. YouTube. And it's weird because in his trial, 
they heard him on the radio and then weirdly all of that seems to have disappeared <laughs> all of the clips of him doing it um mm. which does suggest to me that it's not something the americans particularly still want to be broadcast he wasn't actually very good at it so even the nazis <laughs> only let him do it a few times and then they sort of redirected him into written propaganda also feeling that his strengths didn't lie in you know, in live broadcasting <laughs> can you just give it a bit more oomph martin you know just just a few more hiles a few, you know a bit more fire <laughs> you know i said up top that he was the only military man to defect to nazi germany but there were other people from allied nations working with him at these propaganda headquarters there was one called uh, her nickname was axis sally and mm. she she reportedly loathed Monty and didn't want to work with him. She thought, probably not incorrectly, that he was maybe a spy or a traitor. I mean, he does seem to have oscillated quite a lot in his opinions, so I think that's mm. probably fair game. But mm. so there were actually quite a lot of defectors. It's just none of them were military. Most of them were either German Americans who had, as you said earlier, Ollie, who had returned to Germany, or they were journalists who'd been covering Nazi Germany and kind of got sucked in. But yeah, they were all civilians. And none of them then graduated to a fighting role. And that's the other thing that's extraordinary about him. He went from being a US airman through propaganda to actually mm. becoming an SS lieutenant. And that is quite a flip-flop, isn't it? To go from literally <laughs> combat for the Americans <laughs> to combat for the Nazis. He's the only one who yeah. ever did that. Although I do have to say that he wasn't actually ordered to join a combat unit until the final days of the war, whereupon he quickly redefected to the nearest battalion of US troops. And he told them, I don't know what's going on with the US Army at this time. They had a real credulity problem. Yeah, because he turned <laughs> up in a German army outfit. Yes. Yeah, dressed as SS. He was like, I'm a prisoner yeah. of war. They made me wear this. And they only actually charged Monty with desertion and theft. So the desertion was the first act of disappearing from Karachi, and then the theft was presumably taking the aeroplane. And he received this 15-year suspended sentence. Because he managed to get his family to petition his local congressman. So in a letter to President Truman, Walter Plosa, the congressman, wrote, This seems to be the case of an impetuous young man who wanted to fight for America. And that's how it was seen in the press of the day. 1946, the St. Louis Post says, He bailed out, was captured, escaped, and finally made his way back to American forces. His crime appears to have been that he was, in army slang, an eager beaver. And <laughs> that is what... It's obvious now, isn't it? That's just what they wanted to believe. Like, mm. th there was no evidence apart from his own justifications for stealing a plane. But of course, there was no documentation. It would have been very difficult for them to get to the bottom of what he'd actually been doing in Germany. So for a long time, he did manage to coast along on this idea that, yeah, that he had been a prisoner of war. And then the weird thing is, a week after he was released from prison, he re-enlisted in the Air Force as a private. And then he was able to carry on serving until finally through a tip-off from an army criminal investigation officer, the newspaper columnist Drew Pearson, who we mentioned in our Patton episode, he hmm. wrote an expose on Monty in the Washington Post, and that led to a big inquiry which uncovered all of this crazy stuff that he'd actually been up to. I mean, re-enlisting as a private must have been a covering his tracks exercise. He must mm. have been like, oh, a good stint of honourable service without any defections this time yes. will possibly get me out of this. And so then he was brought to trial this time on treason charges in 1949. And in classic Monty style, he first entered a not guilty plea and then immediately <laughs> changed it to guilty and really shocked the courtroom. There was, I think there's a point where the judge says, so to be clear, you are saying you did this knowingly. And he's like, yes. And everyone's kind of like, huh, okay. <laughs> and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison, and he served 19 of them. But then later tried to withdraw his guilty plea. Ah, uh, yes, I'd forgotten about the final flip-flop. Would you, I mean, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, actually, I'm sorry, I was wrong a few years ago when I said I, I had deliberately joined the SS. That's the kind of thing you just stumble into by accident, actually. Sorry, I should have been clearer. Yeah. And then after he was released in 1968, he never spoke publicly about his actions during the war, his motivations. He lived a really obscure life. I think he, he lived in Florida, but he just, he just lived for another like 30 years or something and then died and never, never really told anyone what was going on. Hey, Granddad, what did you do in the war? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. well. Um. <laughs> Tomorrow. And he was an author of almanacs, which were a really big deal at the time. Every home would have one because we've they all would seen Back to the Future. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, part of the Acast Creator Network.